let me let me begin by first uh, acknowledging uh, the privilege that is being extended to me. I want to acknowledge the principal, Professor Ndavisen Ogude, even though she is not here. Uh, she has been very well represented by yourself, and I am really honored for, for me to speak here at her pleasure. I also want to thank yourself, uh, Professor Bengu, uh, Dr. Minele, my good colleague and friend who has just introduced me. I and him always meet in uh, Dr. Um, Master Mule will always meet at uh, political uh, functions during elections. We cancel the politicians when they are <laughs> worried about the election results <laughs> as we wait in the hall and uh, the elections are being counted. It's good to reconnect with you. I am really honored to be here. I've just come back from Europe uh, so my lecture is really a conversation uh, rather than a hardcore lecture. The title was given to me by the organizers and being a disciplined cadre of the movement, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I accepted the title without changing it much. The Road to Mangawung 2012. We have become accustomed to talking about the road to Mangawung. The truth of the matter is that many roads can take you to Mangawung. In fact, any road can take you to Mangawung eventually. Nor is the multiplicity of uh, roads to Mangaung the only complexity. Some roads to Mangaung are tarred, others are not. Some have potholes, others are smooth highways. Your road to Mangaung also depends on your starting point, or as they say in GPS language, your current location. It matters whether one goes from Tuba Tuba to Mangaung or whether one goes from Messina to Mangaung or Alexander to Mangaung. Indeed, some roads are up in the air, literally. This brings to bear the question of the type of transport means one uses to go to Mangaung. Most will probably go by bus, some will fly business class, and others will even do better and charter planes to go to Mangawu. I want to stick with this metaphor of the road to Mangawu throughout my short talk here. Why is Mangawu important? That's the first subheading. The township of Mangaung occupies a special place in both the geography and the history of South Africa. Geographically, it is to be found at the heart of the country, right in the middle. Historically, it is the place, it, it has a special place in the history of this country. Both the National Party and the African National Congress were founded in Greater Mangaung. Of course, the National Party will tell you they were founded in Bloemfontein. But what is Bloemfontein if not Mangaung? <laughs> <laughs> the former party, that is the National Party, was responsible for the infamous apartheid system, while the latter was responsible for dismantling apartheid and installing a democratic system in its place. Between the two of them, the National Party and the ANC, these parties have governed South Africa for more than 60 years. For the ANC in particular, 
the place Mangaung occupies an even more special place. That is where it all started. The ANC celebrated its centenary on 8th January this year, and rightfully and understandably, they went back to Mangaung. The party will return to Mangaung for its 53rd national conference in just over a month from now. Clearly, Mangaung is for the ANC more than just a venue for an elective conference. It is a place of beginnings, a place of envisioning, a sacred place where it all started. Indeed, more than a place, it is a moment for the ANC, a moment that marks a beginning, the beginning of the journey of liberation. While all roads will be going to Mangaung in December, there is a sense in which Mangaung is, for the ANC, the place where all roads began 100 years ago. In going back to Mangaung, the ANC is returning to source. Some of you may know Amos Isar's uh, famous poem, uh, Retour au pays natal, return to the place or the country of birth. Physically, and of course, uh, Cizé was talking about a return to source, uh, rediscovering yourself, recapturing your, your black soul uh, in particular. Physically returning to Mangaung is easy, but reclaiming and revitalizing and returning to the original idea of Mangaung is harder. But then, what is that original idea of Mangaung? If Mangaung 2012, the 53rd Congress of the ANC, matters to the ANC for obvious reasons, should it matter so much to South Africans? I wish to suggest that Mangaung matters very much to South Africans, whether they are members of the ANC or not. If we think American elections matter to us, Mangaung matters a lot more. A casual look at the policy <laughs> issues being addressed in the 13 or so discussion documents will tell you that every South African ought to sit up and notice and take notice of Mangaung 2012. The issues, policy issues to be discussed include land reform, social transformation, the maximization of the developmental impact of mineral assets, economic transformation, education, health, communication, gender, and so on. No South African say that no South African can say that policies designed to regulate these major areas in the life of the nation are of no relevance to them. Policy refinement and policy resolutions are really what the conference is or ought to be about. For as long as the ANC is the ruling party, the national conference of the ANC is the parliament before the parliament. Perhaps if the country did not have the problems we have in virtually all of the areas to be addressed in the policy discussion documents of the ANC, we could afford, perhaps, if we didn't have so many problems to ignore these discussions. There is another reason why Mangaung 2012 is important. Part of what it means to be a liberation movement as opposed to being a political party should include that the ANC is concerned about and things that are of interest to more than just its signed up members. I saw when I checked their website not so long ago that the ANC still describes itself as a liberation movement. And that's part of what it means to be a liberation movement. Uh, otherwise, uh, the ANC should just become a party if all it is concerned about uh, are its members. Although the ANC has slightly more than a million members, I think 1.2 members we are told now, it has managed to get more than 10 million South African votes each time we have gone to the polls. And that tells you precisely uh, the story I'm trying to highlight here. 
While many of them who vote for the ANC may not be card-carrying members, they nevertheless consider themselves as belonging to the ANC. And I think sometimes the ANC is confused about this. When people say, we belong to the ANC and we want you to do this and that, and they say, show me, show me the card. And people say, I don't need to have a card. And that's part of, uh, of, of this debate about what it means to be a, a liberation movement. And it's as true for the ANC as it is for the PAC and uh, the Black Consciousness Movement. Perhaps the most obvious reason why Mangaung 2012 is important is that the officials who will be elected there, especially those in the top six and a few of those in the National Executive Committee, will end up as leaders and officials in parliament, in provincial, ex provincial executive committees, in metros and municipalities, in cabinet, some of them will end up there. Some of them will be catapulted into BEE deals. Um, uh, some will, will, will get to the helm of state-owned enterprises, and uh, others will take various important positions. And most importantly, we'll also get the president and the deputy president of the country, ultimately, from Mangaung. It may not look like that now, but, but actually Mangaung chooses our president uh, for us, whether we are members of the ANC or not, indirectly. Mangaung is, is also an important stop, both for the ANC members and other South Africans, on the road to the 2014 national elections. Now, the road to Mangaung is paved in numbers. That is the second subheading. The road to Mangaung is paid in numbers. Numbers and provincial leanings have always played an important role. It is always important to remember that although the decisions taken in Mangaung will ultimately affect all of us, they will nevertheless be taken by 4,500 voting delegates. Uh, someone worked out what percentage of the South African population that is. Uh, I think it is less than uh, a percent of the South African population. Of the provinces, KZN will send 974 delegates. We know that. Almost 1,000 delegates. The first big five provinces, let me just mention those. I, I think you know all of them. Eastern Cape, six, 676. Limpopo, 574. Gauteng, 500. And Bumalanga, 465. Those are the big five of the provinces of the ANC. Uh, much as we talk about the big five universities uh, in this country. So perhaps we should talk about the big five provinces of the ANC. And between them, they will field more than 3,000 uh, voting delegates. So they are very, very powerful, these delegates who come from, from these provinces. Now, while the astronomical growth in KZN numbers of, of members of the ANC has raised many eyebrows, uh, the KZN province has in fact been growing steadily for a long time. I think uh, anyone who can go back and look at the numbers over the past few years, you will see that there has been a steady growth. It's just that perhaps the growth uh, between January and September this year is, is mind-boggling. But, but, <laughs> but there has always been growth uh, for some years in that province. How will these numbers affect the outcomes of Mangaung elections, the numbers of delegates? Now, of course, elections should not be merely about numbers, but also about the contestation of ideas around visions espoused, the caliber of candidates, their suitability, as well as um, their own abilities. The closest, I want to suggest, that we came to a sharp debate around vision has been during the time when the ANC was debating the notion of second transition. 
And of course, some were suspicious about the debate, feeling that the ruling party was using this notion to seek yet another mandate to do what it should have done in the past 18 years. That was basic, the basic concern that people were, were having with that debate. There was also a palpable fatigue with people feeling that the party was slipping into a permanent transition mode. Whereas the transition was supposed to be a bridge that helps us cross the apartheid legacy Rubicon, it was now becoming a place of settlement. I think it's Njabulo Ndebele who talks about a, a uh, post-reconciliation South Africa, that South Africa is in danger of stagnating in reconciliation language and reconciliation talk. You could, you could substitute reconciliation with a, a second transition here. And by the end of the policy conference in Midrand, the second transition had become the second phase of a single and continuous transition, and I'm quoting. Now, is that a change of semantics or was it a change of content? <coughs> Uh, did it signal a major shift? Now, the answer to that question depends on who you ask uh, from among uh, members of the ANC who were at the conference. The official word seemed to be saying that there was broad agreement. I think those are the exact words that uh, Jeff Hadeve used, broad agreement with the original uh, idea of second transition idea, but it was felt that uh, uh, that notion should be changed for second phase. Yet, there are many others who came out of that, that conference insisting that the idea has been rejected uh, completely. Now, this is an issue of vision. And one wishes that it had been debated more and that perhaps it had been opened up uh, for debate in, in wider society. And maybe that's why an institution such as this has got a, a wonderful uh, series of, of talks such as the, uh, this one. Now, back to numbers before I move on. The big question in Mangaung is what role KZN will play? And KZN as in the 974 delegates, because we must also remember when we're talking KZN in Mangaung, you're not talking KZN as in all of the members. There, you're just talking about the 974 uh, delegates who will be there. Will they all vote the same way? Uh, in other words, will they listen to instruction uh, as to how they must go and vote? And how will the four, the other four provinces who I identified as the big five, vote, will they vote in such a manner as to strengthen KZN or will they dilute uh, the impact of KZN in much the same way that we heard about uh, battleground states and swing states uh, in the recent American election, uh, Virginia, California, Pennsylvania, Nevada, they are the battleground states. Is, is Eastern Cape, has Eastern Cape become a battleground province, uh, for example? Will Limpopo become a battleground province, given that its numbers are not so high, but it could impact uh, on, on what happens? In the next section, I have subtitled it Mangaung via Fixback, <laughs> because we're still on the road. <coughs> Now, you know what happened in Fixback. Estimates of the so-called service delivery protests in this country vary. Some people suggest that we are having at least one service delivery protest per day uh, this year. But I've just read a very interesting report uh, which was compiled by a a student um, under supervision uh, analyzing the, the causes and the trends and the patterns and the numbers of service delivery protests in this country. 
But before I get to that report, I think it's important to recognize that Mangaung 2012 occurs in the backdrop of five years of some of the most intense service delivery protests this country has ever seen. The period between 2008 and 2012 has seen many, many service delivery protests. You could argue that there were as many in the last years of uh, the Thabo Mbeki administration. But some things have changed. We have seen a lot more violence uh, coming into the service delivery protests, violence by the state, violence by the protesters. I'm not, when I say violence, often uh, violent protests, we, we're only thinking of the protesters uh, alone. And some of, the, the, some of these uh, protests have become milestones in the ongoing national drama. Think, uh, for example, of the May 2008 xenophobic uh, attacks as they are described. Uh, and I think even to call them xenophobic is to honor them, uh, to give them more respect than, uh, than necessary because uh, I didn't see many uh, non-black uh, people being attacked during May. Uh, 2008. So perhaps this is uh, Afrophobia uh, rather than xenophobia as others have suggested. It, it was a very important moment in this country, uh, what happened in May during 2008. You will of course recall that of the 60 or so people who were killed, nearly 20 were South Africans. And you know why? Because many South Africans look like Africans. <laughs> and then <laughs> and then there was the Medpelling water uh, protests the Fixback protests uh, which unfortunately uh, became famous because of the killing of Andris Tatani and what was uh, quite striking about that killing was that it was done live on TV and we'll talk about the other live killings that we show. Right before our eyes, uh, we saw the drama. We saw it happening. And for a few days, we were served uh, that menu again and again. Now, back to that report I was talking about. That report talks about at least 24 causes of service delivery protests which protesters themselves have identified. And the top six, the ones that recur in many of the service delivery protests, I like the report because it's comprehensive. It covers the entire country uh, from about 2007 to 2011. The top six reasons given by people as to why they protest, number one is housing. Uh, they even have a little graph showing you uh, this. Number one is housing. The second one is electricity. The third one is water. Um, the fourth one is general service delivery. And the fifth one is sanitation. Sanitation, uh, for those of you who might not know what it means, it means toilets. <laughs> Toilet saga, uh, the problem that we have in this country. No, not just toilets. I'm joking. But you know how toilets became important in the local elections, the past local elections. <laughs> Other issues about which people uh, protest include infrastructure, corruption, uh, protest against specific officials, unemployment. There was even uh, uh, some protests on broken promises where people felt they were promised things that were not done, uh, protests for incompetent officials, uh, protests about poverty, and so on. Now, these are the issues South African protest most about. Clearly, therefore, whatever else Mangaung addresses, if it does not lay the foundation in terms of which government will address these issues, we are bound to see more of the same. Indeed, Mangaung 2012 itself might become a site of protest 
Uh, we saw what happened in, uh, in Pulukwane. Uh, I have had some, muni uh, some municipal and government officials suggesting that uh, we shouldn't take all the service delivery protests seriously. Some, some people say these are organized and orchestrated, some of them. You must look at their timing and when they happen. I hear all of that. But I've never yet been shown a, an instance where people are protesting about water when they have it, or about houses when they have houses, or about electricity when they have electricity. I've never seen an instance where the problem people are protesting about is, is actually false, or, or, or a myth, or something that they just imagine. As we can see from the reasons for protests given by protesters themselves, the protests speak not always or only of lack of basic service, uh, services, but the, lacks, the, the lack of the next level of services. I mean, for example, you give people houses. What do people do with houses if they don't have jobs? So the, 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 the very basics you give them demand that you give them more. Because if you don't, they are going to sell their house to the person with the money. Because you don't eat the house, uh, even if you live in one. Now, the scandal of, uh, of these service delivery protests is that while some citizens lack these services, some citizens have all of these services and have them in abundance. For me, the protests are a sign of two types of gaps. The gap between rich and poor, and the gap between poor citizens and their government. The gap between followers and their leaders. That gap is as dangerous as the gap between rich and poor. Mangaung has got to be awake to these issues around uh, these service delivery protests. Mangaung via Marikana. Though the specter of violence both by state and citizens has been rearing its ugly head for some time, Marikana stands out. First, we must call Marikana what Marikana is. Marikana is a massacre. Now, I hear so many political speeches being given where they talk about, they use all sorts of euphemisms, the Marikana tragedy, the Marikana incident, the unfortunate events of Marikana. Why don't you just call Marikana what it is? It is a massacre. It's the Marikana massacre. Now, what we call Marikana, is very important for in my view what you call it is part of the journey we must take as a nation to ensure that it never happens again if you can't name it you are not going to fix it it's like a man who has raped and talks about that thing i did <laughs> if he talks like that he's going to rape again <laughs> but if he if he if he mentions it by name there's every likelihood that it might never happen again. And so I'm worried about this avoidance of calling Marikana what it is. I see that the SABC has now adopted officially to call it a tragedy every time they refer to it. Now, a peacetime event in which 34 human beings are killed in less than five minutes must be called a massacre because it's not a war, and it's not a, a conflict between two equal groups uh, in terms of, uh, of, of their, uh, the weapons that they have in their hands. How the current Marikana Commission, how government, how Lonmin treats family survivors and victims uh, of Marikana is for me more important than the findings of that commission. And sometimes when I follow what is going on in the commission, I get the idea that the important thing is the findings that they will give us at the end. 
I mean, what can they tell us what we don't know? The important thing is how the victims are treated, they, how they are handled, and the survivors and the families throughout the process and beyond. Marikana is the first post-apartheid massacre carried out by the state since Sharpeville. Now, I know some people say, protest and say, don't talk about Sharpeville, it's different. Maybe it is different because 1960 and 2012 are very different years. But what is common is that it's the violence of the state upon its own citizens. What is common is also some of the denials by the state and government officials, which sound to me very similar. There was a police uh, uh, chief during Sharpeville who explained what happened and he said, you know, when these people get together in such a big crowd, crowd violence is likely to happen. And so we had to take action to prevent violence happening. Then I had stories about some Sangoma who had told the people there that uh, they will not die even if they are shot at, that they will not be seen. And then you see, these people were under a spell. They were dangerous. We had to do something. Same kind of rationality, which, which, which sort of prepares you to accept the killing of, uh, of citizens. Marikana exposed the state as a participant in the culture of violence. Marikana exposed the dire working and living conditions of mine workers. Marikana exposed the unwillingness of mine houses to be involved in the improvement of living and wage conditions of workers. Marikana exposed the inability or unwillingness of BEE to assist the transformation of the mines as well as the improvement of the living and wage conditions of workers. Marikana exposed the growing gap between unions and workers. It exposed the growing crisis in which NUM and by extension COSATU and by extension the ANC find themselves in relation to workers in general and in relation to their members in particular. All of these things may have been hidden to us, but not after Marikana. We, 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 we know about them because Marikana played them out for us. And perhaps Marikana also exposed the growing realizations by workers that they are on their own. Uh, you remember the Black Consciousness slogan, uh, consciousness slogan uh, which was sexist, uh, uh, black men, you are on your own, as if the, the, the black women were not there and the white women were not there. How will Mangaung be affected by Marikana and related? I have a sense that Marikana is going to show up in Mangaung in one form or the other. It may not show up in changing the leadership uh, in any particular or overt manner, but Marikana cannot be ignored. It will be sitting among the delegates in Mangao. It will show up. It's showing up already in the country and it will continue to show up after Mangao. Mangao Vayanganda. There is probably a perfect and very normal explanation for the renovations in Ganda. Without seeking to disrespect the hardworking journalists who broke the story about the so-called Nkandla Gate. I must say that I, until now, I am yet to see something that is concrete, something that is conclusive, something that proves beyond doubt that there is graft or undue use of state coffers to renovate the president's home. Till now, what we have are allegations, concerns, suspicions, fears, legitimate fears. And I'm afraid I must say that I am not able to allay those fears, either for myself or for others. 
For this reason, it would help both the president and the country if his name was cleared of any wrongdoing in the Nkanda renovations. The fact that the public protector has since announced that she will include Nkanda renovations in her investigations gives me hope. And for now, I live in that hope. The questions being raised around Nkanda renovations, though unproven, are nevertheless extremely damaging to the president's person and character and to the country's image. This is certainly not the kind of attention the president wants at this time. Mangaung or no mangaung. It is eroding his integrity badly. It is certainly not the kind of exposure the country needs. Nor was the intercepted inspection visit by a DA delegation led by Helen Zile necessarily the best way to deal with these allegations. I think what the DA initiative has succeeded to do is to bring more media attention to Nkandla. I saw some uh, international networks uh, flighting that story. Uh, what the DA has succeeded to do is to bring more attention to itself, and I think that was the main aim of the, the so-called inspection visit. The DA might have, in my view, spent its energy better by providing assistance to the state organs who are already currently co conducting investigations on the renovations. But I also think what the DA action did was to provoke and, and induce, if you like, some of the worst behavior from some members of the ANC who were allegedly defending the private home of their leader from invasion. You know, the, the DA seems able all the time to press a button and cause members of the ANC to do things that you look at them doing this. <laughs> and maybe that's part of the plan of the DA to, uh, to induce uh, such actions. I mean, some of the scenes that one was seeing there were not very uh, uplifting. Fortunately for Jacob Zuma, his supporters do not seem to regard the allegations around Uganda renovations as a comment on his character. They tend to see these allegations as the work of the president's detractors, and his supporters will in all probability still vote for him in Mangaung. So uh, anyone who, th who thinks that uh, Nkandla Gate will affect uh, voting patterns of the 4,500 delegates in Mangaung might, might have to, to reconsider that. Now, to conclude, going to Mangaung with Mutlante or Zuma, because it's not only the road you use to go to Mangaung, it's who you go with. <laughs> <laughs> in his lecture in honor of O.R. Tambo, the president of the ANC, Jacob Zuma, spoke about the need to move away from an organization riddled with factionalism and what he called petty squabbles. Unfortunately, Neither the factionalism nor the squabbles in the party at the moment are petty. I wish I could say that we should distinguish between temporary Mangaung inspired factions and those that are more permanent. The truth is that some factions are rather resilient. Some of the factions of the bitter contestation between Mbeki and Zuma in 2007 have refused to die and we know uh, if we had time, we could talk about how some of these continue uh, to exist in various spaces. Instead, many of them have mutated, reinvented, and resurfaced in the current situation where a contestation between Deputy President Khalima Mutante and President Jacob Zuma is looming. Now, I can officially announce that Khalima Mutante will stand. I actually don't know. 
But all indications, all indications are that Khalima Mutante will contest the presidency of the ANC. And with that, he will also contest Zuma's right to a second term. This was clear when he disagreed so vehemently with Zuma on the second transition. You remember that debate where he said, what is it? What is this thing called second transition? That was, for me, the first signal. Because when you have the president of an organization and the deputy president disagreeing about what looks like the vision of, of, an, of, of, of their organization, uh, then there must be something else going on. And I think it was, for me, the first indication. We now also know about his voice of dissent uh, regarding the manner in which the youth league leaders, Shivambu, Makaka, and Malima, were sanctioned by the ANC. Why is he letting us know about that now? Now, some people may say, it's not him, it's Harvey, his biographer. <laughs> but that's an authorized biography. <laughs> and I think that there is some method in the madness uh, with which this book has been written and the timing of its publication. Why do we need to know that Khalima Mutante did not quite agree with the manner in which uh, the youth league leaders uh, were sanctioned? I think we are being uh, informed about that so that we see the signal uh, that he is going uh, to contest. More recently, uh, Mutante has said in an interview with the Financial Times that the country is in crisis and that Mangaung 2012 will be the tipping point. Now, again, a deputy president who speaks like that, for me, says that he is unhappy about something and there is something that he wants to fix. And of course, that sentiment earned him a public rebuke by the president. We also know now about the events of uh, the appearance of both Zuma and Mutante in Bizana in the Eastern Cape over the past two weeks. We know who had lunch at the Tambo home and who was not there. We know at whose uh, occasion uh, one of the Tambo children was and at whose occasion uh, they were not. Uh, and all of these, I think, are indications that uh, Mutante is, is probably going to stand. We also see more and more indications that the ABZ lobby is gaining strength. That does not mean that they are gaining votes, okay? but they certainly are gaining strength in terms of uh, becoming more and more brave uh, and more and more brazen. I have seen uh, yesterday the, that there is a new website called Forces for Change. And that website uh, already uh, provides you with a slate with Halima Mutante at the top of that slate. So what we used to call the ABZ lobby is fast becoming the Halima Mutante support lobby. That lobby which was faceless and perhaps uh, in some ways it looked like a lobby that knows what it is against but not what it is for, I think has found in Mutante uh, a metaphor and a representation of what it stands for. I've recently, uh, yes, I've, I've said that, let me skip there. Mutante himself is becoming more and more explicit about his willingness to stand if nominated. I think there is a sentence that he issued out in the Eastern Cape uh, that is almost clear that if one is, is, is requested and uh, one is able, uh, one can try or something to that effect. <laughs> his refusal though to declare his candidacy openly outside of the party rules and processes 
is proving to be more of a tactical maneuver rather than a sign of indecision. I think until now, people have been wondering whether he's undecided, does he have the appetite, is he satisfied with the pension that he has, and so on. <laughs> like a good football striker, uh, by the way, I and him come from Midlands, so I know that uh, there's legend in Midlands about his uh, soccer playing uh, skills. Um, Mutante is refusing to be, to be caught offside. You know, a good striker uh, stays behind the line so that they are not caught offside. And I think that more and more we see that this might be the tactic that he is using. Like a ma master marksman, he is keeping his bullets and holding his fire for as long as possible until the other side have spent all their bullets. He has apparently refused the advances of the Zuma lobby, which have said, uh, become deputy, uh, we will support you, but don't dare challenge uh, for the presidency. He has also chastised anyone who has tried to co-opt him, at least publicly. Um, but I think in offering him the deputy presidency, what the Zuma lobby is doing is acknowledging him as a threat to that lobby, threat in inverted commas, because I mean, this is familiar affair. I mean, people are fighting inside the, the, the ANC. In the process, he, Halima is gradually and carefully projecting an image of someone who respects the ANC, someone who respects its structures, someone who respects its values and its ethics and its rules. And that is the image that is being built. Even this biography, so-called, that Avi has written, it is, it is designed to project that image of someone who puts the party first, who wants to return to the source of, of the original vision, if you like, uh, of the party. So the idea here is that when he stands, not if he stands, when he stands and if he wins or if he loses, he will have done so as a disciplined cadre of the ANC. In this way, his stature may grow in the ANC whether he wins or he loses. As I know that his lobby uh, will not want to consider him losing. Also uh, has the potential strength of the numbers, which I tried to indicate to you uh, earlier. My colleague, uh, Professor Susan Boisen, talks about the Zulufication of the ANC uh, in, in, in so far as uh, the rise of the KZN. So that's what Zuma has going for him. Could he lose at Mangaung? I saw a tweet the other day, which I thought was quite interesting. Uh, after uh, Punya Selesele uh, beat the uh, Orlando Pirates there, and the tweet said, Mangaung is no place to go and defend the crown. <laughs> So is it possible that Zuma could lose? But I, I think it's possible, but very unlikely. Uh, if one looks at the numbers game, and if one looks at the, the power of uh, incumbency and, uh, and the ability of an incumbent to, to mobilize uh, resources and to mobilize people. But it's possible that Zuma could win and still lose in terms of his ability to manage the challenges of the party and the state. The so-called lame duck scenario, where you get a, a winner, uh, but with very much reduced uh, ability to, to lead and to manage things. So, 
that is possible. But there are people who argue that what difference does it make whether it is Zuma or Halima? It's still the ANC. And let's face it, Halima is not going to come with something drastically different from what Zuma might bring. Any more than Zuma has managed to bring anything drastically different from what Mbeki had put in place. In fact, so many Mbeki things are going on and continuing, except that some of them are not called by the names that they were originally uh, started under. <laughs> So there's also that possibility that it really doesn't matter. But for some people, it could be that it matters. And uh, uh, I am, as you know, a, a neutral observer in these matters. Thank you very much. <laughs>